Hi, welcome to another episode of Design Spark Ask the Expert. Today we're talking about functional safety and how microcontrollers play an important role in safety critical systems and what considerations you must take as a designer to ensure critical systems are safe when using microcontrollers. We welcome Jacob Lund Larson, subject matter expert on functional safety from microchip technology. He's an expert with more than 20 years experience on microcontroller systems. Hi Jacob, welcome to Design Spark. Thank you. So Jacob, essentially, what is functional safety? Right, um, so so uh, when we talk about functional safety, um, as, as you mentioned initially, we're talking about safety critical systems. Um, but I think the, the main thing that many people do not understand is that there is a clear distinction between a safety feature and functional safety. Um, and, and I think the best way to, to illustrate this is, is to give an example. Um, um, if we take, for instance, a gas furnace, um, it is it is quite obvious to many people that a gas furnace would um, potentially leak gas, and gas is uh, flammable. It could cause an explosion of fire. So you would want to have some sort of safety mechanism for for such a system. And um, if we consider that you have a, a gas detection sensor, or you have a sensor that can detect uh, whether there is a flame in the burning chamber. Um, that is not functional safety, but that's rather a safety feature. So in that way, you distinguish between um, features that you add to control the safety and the functionality of those features, that the correct intended function of those features as functional safety. Okay, so in the... Uh, example you just gave is it to ensure that the the valve is closed and is there no flame in the burning chamber right right um the um the the, the main thing so you could say if we have for instance the, the the flame detection sensor um the functional safety portion of it is to detect whether the sensor would potentially have failed and the same, as you mentioned, for a valve that would, in that case, be used to close the gas. Um, it would be relevant to figure out if that valve is working as intended, uh, or if you actually have to uh, maybe sound an alarm so that people can respond to it. Okay. So what if that extra valve or the redundant flame sensor also fails? Yeah, this is sort of the the death uh, death of spiral wh where would you stop um uh, the the good thing is that the standards are prescribing how you deal with this and um i mean functional safety is much about uh likelihood of of a failure happening um and and the the main point point is that you want to reduce the uh, likelihood of a failure so you're looking at uh, likelihood, severity, controllability. There's a bunch of things that you're looking at when you're classifying these um, applications. Um, and it's maybe a little bit brutal to say so, but it's about, you, you, since you cannot avoid a failure, you cannot have a probability that is zero. Mm -hmm. You can do everything at your disposal to minimize the probability or the severity of of a failure, and <clears throat> that is where we come to the term where we say, is it an acceptable risk? Um, if if we know that you would you would have a bruise if something goes wrong, well, maybe it's an acceptable risk that it may happen on a regular basis because you're not really injured. Um, but if 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 you if we're talking about laws of lives and so on, that's a different thing. So what we look at is. Um, what is called uh, failure rates or failures in time or fit, um, which is the probability of, of a failure, an undetected dangerous failure um, would happen. And um, to, to get back to your actual question, the, the standards are often saying that you should look at single faults. So if we look at, for instance, the, the flame uh, detection sensor, that is just one fault. You would assume that that sensor is not failing at the same time as the valve. Mm -hmm. Because the 
again, we come back to probabilities. The likelihood that both should happen at the same time is much smaller than one of those happening individually. And that is where we talk about the, the FIT rate. Um, FIT is the occurrence of a dangerous fault um, per billion hours of operation. So if we say 10 FIT, it means that you have one failure per 1 million hours of operation. And that sounds like crazy large numbers, but there's a lot of hours in a year. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of cars in the streets. So, <laughs> so those numbers add up to, to actual failures. But the thing that I wanted to get to is that if you say that the probability of the sensor failure is, is, is one fit or 10 fit, and the probability of the valve failure that can close the gas is 10 fit, the combined probability is um, one failure per 10 million billion hours of operation. Then right. the numbers are getting very big and, and the yeah. probability of things happening is, is getting quite small. And that is right. why we're looking at, at, at this. Okay, but in terms of microchip, you make microcontrollers. So could you just explain to me um, how functional safety is relevant on the microcontroller level? Yes, um, we often have to look at this um, on different levels and the microcontroller can be considered the subsystem um, in, in this bigger system. Um, and, and the microcontroller is, is playing a potential relevant role in, in a safety critical system. Um, if we continue with the example of, of the gas furnace and the um, flame sensor uh, and the valve, the microcontroller may use an ADC to read the flame sensor. It may use a general IO pin to control the valve. And the un uncomfortable question that would then be raised is, well, what happens if the ADC is not working and it appears that the flame sensor um, is uh, saying, well, the flame is present while it's not? Or if the uh, IO pin that is intended to close the gas valve indicates that the valve is closed, but it isn't. So that is why we are looking at, at this from a microcontroller view um, as well. Um, OK, so the example you give of the ADC and IO pins, then would you consider them in the same way as you would for the um, the flame sensor on the gas valve? Yes, exactly. So um, we, you would use the same principles there. You would use um, diagnostic mechanisms to uh, figure out what is actually going on, whether things are working or not. Um, so we would, what we actually do is that we provide uh, a number of collaterals that um, will help the developer or what we call the system integrator and the safety uh, application um, understand the probability of failures for different uh, microcontroller subsystems, so an ADC or an IO pin or whatever function that is required. So with that, the system integrator can calculate the fit contribution from the microcontroller itself. So the two documents that I'm talking about here is um, a document called the FMEDA or the um, failure mode uh, effect and diagnostics uh, analysis. Uh, and the other one is, is referred to as a safety manual. Um, so we, we can just have a look at the um, FMEDA. I have um, a sample document that I can show okay. you. Right, yeah. Let me share. So um, this is a, I, I said it's a document. In, in reality, I would rather say that it's a tool. Um, and the reason why I say it's a tool because uh, it would, it is used to calculate your fit rate. So here you have a number of modules. So the actual FMEDA would contain a lot more modules. Uh, it would contain all the modules of the microcontroller. Um, but this one is just a sample document because these documents are distributed. They, they're not distributed publicly. They're not on our website, something you have to request. Okay. So if we look at, for instance, the GPIO, so an IO pin, we would have a number of, of columns here. Um, the first one is the fit rate um, distribution. So what is the contribution from that specific module? 
we have a number saying how many instances we have of that module and the um the the the, the total fit rate um of those um in this case 54 um gpio pins then the next column column e let me just highlight it here is um describing the failure mode so basically um it means which ways have we considered that this function in the device may fail mm -hmm. so an io pin can be stuck so it would be high or low it may not generate an output so it might be floating um so all of these things are described in this document so the failure mode and what is the effect a stuck pin would potentially give the incorrect output a pin that is not giving an output um, at all would be in high impedance it would be floating and so on and and there you do, then go in and calculate so what is the probability of that specific failure to happen based on uh, expert assessment analysis of the design and so on and that would eventually um, give the user the system integrator um, the ability to assess how critical is this for, for them so they would choose um, if they have an IO pin, which is um, safety critical, which represents a safety feature, they would indicate that they have to relate to, to that. And while all the other IO pins, which are not used for safety critical functionality, they would, um, they would be taken out of the equation because they would maybe control an LED that is not safety critical for the user. Um, yeah. And for that reason, they do not contribute to the to the fit rate. And then the last column that I wanted to mention here is um, the diagnostic or safety mechanism. So here we have a reference ID or, or label, which is then referring to the safety manual, um, uh, the diagnostics described in the safety manual for that specific kind of test, that diagnostic. Okay. And in terms of the, the safety manual, is there anything that you can share with us on, on those? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I could actually just share that right away um, as well. Um, before I do that, I can just I can just give a comment to it. Um, the safety manual is um, it, it, it's, it's an ordinary document for everyone that are doing safety critical designs, um, but for I was about to say the rest, the the, the majority of the the other uh, embedded designers, um, that is not a, a, a known document, and that's that's really a shame because the safety manual is describing um, a lot of relevant information about the assumed correct use of the product, and in my opinion, it's a document that can raise the quality and the reliability in general for. Uh, any design, not only safety designs. So let me just show you an example of that. <clears throat> there we are. Okay, yeah. So again, this is a sample document. Um, um, I'm, I cannot show the actual document. It's something that is distributed under NDA, uh, non-disclosure agreement. Um, but if 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 a customer is in need of such a document, they can just contact us um, either through our website or um, through a sales office, and, and we'll make sure that they get the document. So <clears throat> I just wanted to mention a, a, a few of the important things. Um, it's describing the system integrator, so the developer's responsibilities. Uh, it's describing the hardware requirements. So are there any specific ways that you need to connect the device to use it in the correct, correct, safe way? Um, it's talking about the uh, software requirements. Is there anything specific? And then there is the general uh, chapter 11 um, assumptions of use, which is talking about, again, what are the assumptions that we have had to make for us to describe what is the right way of using this product in a safe way. So just to go to the um, one of the, the, the important chapters, um, diagnostic mechanisms, we can look at the general purpose uh, IO report, 
they are all described in the same way. And this is just a description of what would be in the table. So each of these chapters would describe the diagnostic mechanism with a table, describes the purpose, what is the purpose of this specific diagnostics test. Um, it has a more elaborate description. So let's say a one liner and a multi liner uh, documentation uh, of, of the diagnostic. And then it describes um, more of the implementation strategy, the recommended implementation strategy. It's, there, there might be other solutions to it, but this is what we recommend. So it describes how would you initialize this sort of, of diagnostic um, and how would it report an error? Would it set a flag? Would it um, trigger a, a reset right away? Or what would be the natural way of doing it? Um, then it's describing the nature of that test. Some diagnostics can be done um, using hardware or hardware accelerators. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then I'm just jumping to the next part of the table here. Um, it's talking about the periodicity um, of such a test. And, and I think it's maybe relevant just to briefly describe what that means. Certain tests um, you would not naturally only do when the system is starting up. You have certain memory tests that are um, destructive, very, very detailed and, and would pick a lot of potential faults, but they are destructive to the content of the flash memory for uh, or the SRAM memory. Um, and for that reason, it would be something you do when you start up the system and then you wouldn't do it again. But then there would be a bunch of other tests that you would do periodically um, that could be related to communication. You want to ensure that communication happens um, at least every 100 milliseconds or whatever it might be. Um, it could be if you have a device that has ECC on, on the flash, it would be more of a demand on demand. Mm -hmm. So it means that whenever you access that flash location, the ECC would be calculated. If it's if that location is faulty, that would trigger a, um, a chain of event. Uh, it would be corrected in the first place, but it could potentially lead to a detection of a, a fault. Um, so in that way, the safety manual is describing a lot of things in in great details and that's why i'm saying that i think this is also something that can be used for um for general embedded developers yeah. to understand how they can make a super robust and reliable system um in general yeah so there's certainly plenty of information there available certainly on request so one of the things I did want to uh, to talk about was um, your development tools for safety critical applications, but just show me the manual there. Before we go on to that, it, it sprung another uh, question. So in terms of the different types of safety standards, could you comment on those? But then also, why are there slightly different standards for di or different product standards available? Right. Um. Yeah, um, I mean, we talked about this before the uh, this conversation, and um, it's basically there are a bunch of of, of different standards um, because different application areas have slightly different needs, um, but they all come back to the same uh, fundamental concepts. And many say that the um, the sixty uh, sixty one five zero eight standard is the the root standards of, of all the others um, that have then gone in slightly different directions um, and you have for instance you have the um, the the one the standard the, the 6730 standard for household appliances which is um, I would say it's, it's quite specific in the way that it describes um, how, how you should follow the the um, um, the requirements it would say test this in this or that way um, and and maybe that is because such products they are are, are fairly um, well defined mm -hmm. I maybe say while other standards like the automotive standard the ISO 26, uh, 262 is much more general in, in nature it is focusing on following um, um, a good process uh, which would reveal any 
safety issues that the sign design may have and would um, describe the steps you need to take to make sure that all of those are handled in the appropriate way. So in that way, they, they have the same objective avoid than you and I, that you and I are, are injured by, by the product, um, but they do it with uh, slightly different strategies. Yeah, I can just I can just show you um, um, a table here. <clears throat> the standards that we are talking about here that I mentioned now is the what I would call the industrial standard for safety applications uh, for electronics, um, and and um, uh, that is the 6508, 61508 standard, mm -hmm. um, which is an using a, a number of different um, safety uh, levels uh, or safety integrity levels, so seal one to seal four. Um, the household appliances standard, the 6730, um, is using slightly different classifications. It's using class A to C. Um, and then you have the um, automotive standard, which is using A seal uh, A to D. So, so they're described slightly uh, differently um, in 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 the way that they um, define the levels uh, and so on, and also they have slightly different ways of um, defining the risk. So while the industrial standard says consequence and probability, um, the household uh, standard, as I mentioned, is more of a, um, what what is the nature of the, the product. Um, and you would apply the appropriate uh, classification for that. So is it flammable, is it not flammable, and so on. And the last one uh, listed here, the, the ISO uh, standard for automotive, talks about severity exposure. So that is, is similar to consequence and probability, but then also controllability. Um, if a fault happens, would the user be able to do anything to prevent injury uh, or, or damage? Okay. So it's important to understand the standard, but also equally important to understand the safety level that you need to have behind each of those standards. Is that right? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I mean, like like we talked about the the um, the gas furnace that would be a, a class C type of application because there is a, an immediate danger of uh, a fire or explosion, while a washing machine would be a class class B type of application um, uh, because, I mean, the danger could be that you will put your hand inside the um, the, the washing machine. If, if you manage to open the door while the drum is, is, is spinning and you put your arm in there, then you would potentially damage your arm, but it would be damaged. It wouldn't be life uh, threatening like a like gas mm -hmm. uh, yeah. product could potentially be. And <clears throat> that is the the same you, you can say for for the other standards. Um, if we look at the automotive specifically, um, we can look at uh, things like uh, brake by wire or steer by wire. And I'm sure that we all understand that if you have electronics only that no mechanical <laughs> system, um, then, then we would appreciate that the electronics engineers and the software engineers doing the embedded stuff they have pretty good control of what they're doing. And such a system would be um, of, of immediate danger to the user and maybe surroundings as well um, if steer by wire, brake by wire is, is failing. So that would be classified as, as an ACLD um, type of application. Yeah, OK. So earlier on, um, there are techniques that, you know, you can make um, it easier to design applications for um, to conform to safety levels you kind of spoke about maybe there was some kind of like divide and conquer approach to this could you just explain that a little bit more yes um if if, if we look at the system like an acld um application break by wire steer by wire whatever it might be um something which is highly safety critical um I'm, I'm sure that we we all acknowledge the fact that you have to consider so many different things at this highest level that um, it is a complex design to do. And the good thing is that there is um, 
something that we refer to as, as decomposition. Um, the different standards are used slightly different terminology for this, but it's it's the same principle. And the idea of decomposition is that you uh, like with with the uh, with um, the probability that I described before that if you combine two different um, valves or two different sensors, for instance, the probability of um, the combined probability will be quite low. So I can just show you a slide um, on, on this as well. So the idea here is that um, if you have an let's just say an ACLB system, the probability would be X for that to fail. But if you have two ACLB systems combined, the um, simultaneous failure of those two systems, subsystems would be significantly lower. And for that mm -hmm. reason, yeah. the it is accepted that you can implement an ACLD application with two ACLB B subsystems. So this slide that I have here is showing two different examples. There are numerous different ways to do it um, in different breaking it up in different ways. So yeah. you have an ACLD application, which can be decomposed to an ACL C combined with an ACL A, or you could have an ACL D that is, is decomposed to an ACL B um, and an ACL B together. So that is the principle of that. And the interesting thing there is that it is so much easier to do an ACLB implementation that you can often um, save quite a bit of, of effort in, uh, let's say, uh, development and certification and maintenance by doing this decomposition that is actually worth it. Um, and, and I sometimes get the question, well, you'd have then probably two microcontrollers. And, and while that is true, um, you would probably have to have a quite powerful microcontroller to do both the application and the ACLD level safety um, in a single microcontroller. So that would be a high-end product. While if you break it down to um, the decomposition components, um, you have much lower requirements. Yeah. And you could probably use, a, let's say, a mid-range microcontroller combined with potentially a, a low-end uh, small micro uh, by doing the decomposition. So it's it's not necessarily more expensive to do an implementation with um, a decomposition solution. It, it can actually save you cost in certain situations. Yeah, so it's definitely an important consideration is the decomposition when you're, you're designing. Yeah, the the other thing I um, just want to talk about if, if a a design engineer is designing obviously a safety critical system. What is it in terms of product choice? Is it any MCU or how do they actually, you know, find the, the MCU that they need? Um, in most microcontrollers can be used in safety applications. And um, the important part to understand is that a microcontroller is just a small computer uh, running a piece of software so if if you are uh, let's say unskilled in safety applications for sure you can write the software for that embedded system in a way so that it will be unsafe running on that specific microcontroller while someone who's skilled on functional safety and safety systems would be able to implement a safe system on that same microcontroller and, and for that reason, you, you can assume that the microcontroller is a, a general product. You can say it's a, a safety element out of context. It doesn't have a specific safety function. That is something that is designed by the system integrator. And in that way, there's no specific requirements for the microcontroller per se. Um, but I think it's, it's worth mentioning that I mean, we we as Microchip, we have tried to make it easy for the system integrator to actually um, find the right product for their uh, design. And if if they choose a product where we have an FMADA and a safety manual, that is a very good first step. Yeah. So what we have done, let me just share again here. Um, what we have done is that we have um, 
describe that on our web page is if the product is is functional safety ready. That's a term that we have uh, created to make sure that people understand um, what this is. Um, uh, if this product is is uh, suitable, uh, so to say, uh, out of the box. Um, let me just show you. Yeah. So if if um, <clears throat> you go to our website, you can go to our functional safety design center. So that would be uh, there's a link in the description for the video here. Um, it would take you to the general page that we have describing all the different products. You can uh, schedule a call if you want to um, talk with us about functional safety or anything else for that matter or contact us by email. Um, but then you also have the details uh, further down here. Let me just scroll all the way down. You have the overview of the different microcontroller products listed here. Um, and then if we go further, further, further down, then you have a list of all the different microcontrollers, several pages here um, that shows which products are actually uh, ready for uh, where we have the FMEDA and the safety manual. Right. And the it, it's important to understand that if if you want to use something else, we can help you. Of course, we need to assess the, the business case. Um, uh, if, if you need five devices and asking us to create these new documents, which are quite time consuming, we probably respectfully decline and recommend you another device. But if if you have a, a, a certain volume, we would try to to create those documents for you. And that would um, I mean, the, the list is quite long of all the products that we have. So if you can choose something that where, where we already have the FMEDA and the safety manual, um, you'll get it quicker. Uh, you are making our life easier and your life easier uh, in that sense. Fantastic. We were talking earlier about, uh, or I, I did say I'd like to talk about development tools. Um, would you be able to take us through any of the development tools you have for safety critical applications and also is it a requirement to use development tools in for safety critical applications? Um, the the um, it, it depends. So if if you are at the lower safety level, so if you are at um, uh, class A, I mean, I, I barely hear about customers using that because it's they wouldn't need anything specific from us probably you would not use specific tools. But as soon as you move up, um, and also I see that as a trend, many customers, they, they're they starting to ask for tools which are qualified for safety Absolutely. applications. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as soon as you start moving up, then then you probably want to go for for a, a tool suite that um, that is, is known to be useful for safety applications. And uh, I, I've thrown up a slide here that uh, shows you what, what we have and and I, I'll, I'll explain a little bit in details. Um, what you need to understand when choosing a tool is whether it can introduce an error in your application, in your system, and whether that error would be detectable if you will discover that an error has been injected by that tool. And you therefore have what is called um, a tools, tool confidence levels, uh, TCL. And uh, TCL level one would mean that it cannot introduce any faults, uh, any, any errors, um, and it cannot, uh, it, if it does, it would be easily discoverable. While you have other tools that could potentially um, cause an error in your system, where it would be uh, possible to discover it, um, or it would be impossible to discover it. So depending on on this matrix, um, the tool is more or less suitable, and you would have to to um, consider different things. So what I've shown here is that we have our two IDEs. We have the the MPLAB X IDE. This is is tool confidence level one together with Microchip Studio, the other IDE. Um, so one is is traditionally used for the AVR and SAM products. Mm -hmm. That is the Microchip Studio, um, formerly called Atmos Studio. And then you have the MPLAB-X IDE, which is covering all the products that we have 
um, the pig products, the um, DS pigs, the uh, SAM, the pig 32 and the AVRs, everything is in there. But both of, both of these are um, IDEs and we have not been able to uh, pinpoint any any uh, hazards for using that. Uh, they cannot introduce uh, an error in the system or it's easily discoverable what they could potentially do. The, the tool where that can influence your, your system is the compiler. And I'm sure that you, you would agree that if you write your code in, in C, um, you compile it to a binary image, there's a translation along that way that could mm -hmm. potentially go wrong. And for that reason, such a product is um, considered a, um, a tool confidence level two. It couldn't inject an error, which might be a little bit difficult to uh, discover. So for that reason, we have a special version of the XC compilers, which is the um, Pro Functional Safety. I should have put that in, in the slide here, actually. But it's called the Pro Functional Safety version or, or license. Um, and 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 there it comes with. If you buy that one, it comes with all the certificate and the test procedures and documentation, the safety documentation that that you'd need right. to take that through um, your audit and document that you're using tools that are suitable for safety applications, tools that you have confidence in, and which have um, for the compiler safety manual that describes how you use it in a safe way. So. We, we do have a range of tools that you can use for safety applications, and I, I highly recommend that you use it. It's the, 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 the functional safety version of the compiler is, is a little bit more, um, is a little bit high cost than the standard version, but it saves you a lot of time and, and eventually cost in, in your certification process by yeah. choosing that right away. So, so yes, we do have those and they cover a bunch of different standards uh, listed on, on this uh, slide as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In 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 terms of save time and, and cost for final certification, it's really imperative because if you have to go back and retrospectively engineer again, it, it can add you know vast amount of cost to the to the end solution or the end application. Exactly, and and you would probably um, lose a lot of time, and you would lose a lot of money if you have to go back and and do that kind of of operation. Uh, be late in the market or whatever is the the biggest pain for you. Um, so do it right from the beginning. Great. Request the tools, request the the documents, and so on, and and you would be uh, starting from a, a very good um, starting point. Okay. So we've covered a lot today, actually. If I think we go back, we we started off with a a flame in a furnace uh, and controlling the valve and we've now come on to safety development tools so we've really covered a lot of information about functional safety i found the conversation to to be fascinating uh, today but also what we'll do is you know, we'll obviously put some links you know to your your um your, your tools and and further information for our design spark users to go and have a look on the microchip site if they're interested in learning more about uh, functional safety and uh, Jacob, I'd just like to say it's been a great pleasure talking to you today and, and thanks for coming to Design Spark to explain functional safety to us. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Jacob, many thanks again for joining Design Spark today and I hope we talk again real soon.